Um, I'm Hilary Phillips. I'm um, involved in leading um, our digital youth work at Youth Link Scotland. So have had a, a, a fair hand in putting the day together. Um, and it's it's been exciting to do that. Um, and um, Jamie's co-hosting this session with me. So Jamie, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Um, my name is Jamie Dungavel. Um, I'm from Education Scotland, one of the CLD education officers and uh, happy to kind of support Hilary and YouthLink um, today, just sharing some some interesting practice that's um, taking part in regards to digital youth work. Um, and also, um, as Hilary will share as well, some of the other interesting um, ambitions that are going forward in enhancing uh, digital delivery and digital um, footprint when it comes to youth work and CLD as a whole. So, um, so our thinking really around um, this particular session um, is simply to provide a place where we can share some of the most inspiring examples of digital youth work, particularly over things that have happened over the last couple of years, obviously heavily influenced by uh, the pandemic. Um, and we've seen uh, an incredible response to that um, from different organizations. And so this is a platform today for people to talk a little bit about um, how they've um, adapted and adjusted, um, some of the learning that's been involved there, some of the impact that that has had um, and, and where they're going next with it. And um, one of um, the, the sort of strong reasons that I wanted um, to see this particular workshop happen was to give people space to also um, talk about um, challenges, talk about things that have, have been um, difficult hurdles that were there and how they've overcome those. So that's sort of part of the story, if you like, of what we've been doing. So we're delighted um, to have um, folk lined up to share with you um, this morning from North Lanarkshire and um, Dumfries and Galloway um, and Aberdeenshire. Um, and Jamie, I'll just, before we go um, to our participants, do you want to um, maybe just say a little bit about um, some of the things that are going on at um, Education Scotland at the moment in relation to um, the development of um, digital CLD and then we can... Um, Absolutely. Um, so uh, no doubt some of you have heard, um, uh, as the, the, the Minister kind of shared some aspects this morning, um, there's been an investment from Scottish Government to try and digitally upskill uh, the sector across the board. Um, and that goes beyond youth work as well. It touches on adult learning, family learning and community development as well. Um, the way this has been done um, through infrastructure is funding a three part project um, which focuses on a range of different aspects but the key elements of that include um, investment in a digital CLD award which is currently under development and I'll put a little um, <clears throat> post in the chat for people to have a wee look at um, from their press release um, but the, the organisation developing that is the Digital Schools Award body um, so based on their expertise and um, rolling out the Digital Schools Award they've also been kind of recruited um, to do that um, and the way that's been developed at the moment is through a partnership approach which would be only fitting for CLD as many of you would agree um, which involves national organisations, partners um, and or just different um, councils as well to kind of discuss how a digital CLD award should look um, and the sort of main elements to make sure it represents uh, the best parts of the sector. Um, the key element of that award is ultimately to help um, organisations and services to think about how to digitally upskill their staff and also to imply and uh, impart um, digital skills to the, the learners that they work with um, and that's the sort of nature of it. So that award and its early infancy will hopefully be released um, for everybody to, to, to take part in um, towards the spring summer time. Um, currently it's in its draft stages. Um, there's some organisations that will hopefully be piloting it in the next couple of months but ultimately it's a unique way of um, the CLD sector um, and all its kind of aspects to essentially take part in a digital program that highlights their digital innovation when it comes to um, the work that they're doing. Um, it's all been done on that front as well. The, there's two other elements in regards to the Open University providing online learning, um, access to micro-credentials, which are short, free accredited courses um, for CLD practitioners, and also at the same time, um, uh, an online platform that can be utilised for 
again, learning information and guidance. And also the CLD Standards Council are um, reviewing their competencies and making sure there's digital competencies as well um, to reflect uh, the current work that's been done in the field. Um, Kirsty is a uh, Gemmel from the, the Standards Council is here today as well. So hopefully if you've got any uh, specific Standards Council's questions, you can answer them in the chat. I'm sure she'll be happy to do that. Um, but ultimately, there's also more information for um, the Open University element that will be shared today, um, just at the end of the conference in regards to um, after Youth Link's um, conference today, just an information session at four o'clock. So that will be shared as well. But hopefully these innovations will you know, enhance people's interest in digital um, and aspects of the work that they do, but ultimately make them keen to try new things and recognise the, the work that their staff and their teams are doing. Um, any questions as anybody goes along, just please put them in the chat or anything like that. That's absolutely fine. Uh, hopefully that kind of summarises everything nicely. Um, hopefully at this stage, I'm happy to kind of pass on to our presenter. Um, so I think we're going for North Lancashire Council first. So Jennifer Lafferty and Susan Duncanson are here today to talk about um, the piece of work that goes with North Lancashire in regards to gaming. Um, so I'll just pass to those, the team, and hopefully you guys are happy to take over from here. Thanks, Jamie. I think um, I'm here. Um, so if it's okay, I'm just going to share my screen just now. Um, I've got a very short presentation. It's only four slides long, so hopefully no one should fall asleep. Uh, can you see the presentation that I'm sharing just now? Is that, is that on your screen? That's great. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So um, we are part of the Wishaw Shots locality for North Lanarkshire Council and one of the things that we've been asked to talk today about is some of the esports groups that we've been running. Um, I'm a bit of a Fortnite gamer and if anybody wants to play I'm more than happy. Kung Fu Su, just look me up. Um, so what is esports? It tends to be one of the questions, like one of the first questions whenever we say that we're running an esports group. So it's part of, um, it's competitive gaming for various types of games. Um, so it could be the multiplayer online battle arenas. It could be first person shooter games. It can be real time strategy games where they're having to respond to what someone else is doing, or it can be open world survival games. And the types of games that we might include are League of Legends, Defense of the Ancients 2, and that sometimes gets called Dota. Call of Duty, Halo, and my personal favourite is Fortnite. Um, why do young people compete in esports? One of the big attractions just now is the prize money or the titles or the bragging rights, whatever it is. And there's a lot of prize money involved in esports. One of the competitions in October last year, um, the team won $30 million. So th th it, there's a big incentive just now for people to get into professional gaming. And there's lots of young people who are really interested in that as a career option as well. Esports is quite an inclusive activity and it's inclusive with an asterisk because it's only inclusive if that young person has the actual technology and the internet access to be able to play online. Um, if they have the platforms like a PlayStation or Xbox or PC to be able to actually deliver or to participate in these activities. Um, Esports, um, it's organized multiplayer games and it's events that are organized either individually, duos, trios or teams. Um, one of the other games that I haven't actually listed on that is Rocket League. Um, and that seems to be a really popular one just now as well. There are a few other games um, like FIFA and all that kind of thing. And uh, FIFA isn't one of the ones that we partner with a, a local esports club called the Brave Junior. Um, they don't actually recommend FIFA as one of the esports activities for young people because of the gambling element to it. But it might be that if you wanted to set up a FIFA competition, then you might want to have that as a discussion for gambling because I think there's lots of packages where you can buy the, the cards and you really don't know what you're buying. So they don't encourage this. Um, the Brave Junior have been absolutely fantastic with us and they've been um, a real instigator in how we move our esports clubs forward. Um, for COP26 that was running um, for two weeks in Glasgow there, they ran a competition across the whole of North Lanarkshire for all of the schools, uh, for all of the high schools. So all the young people could participate if they have an esports club as part of the Future Friday. Um, the, the Future Fridays 
that's uh, our schools, our high schools all finish at half past 12 on a Friday afternoon and the young people who want to participate and engage in other activities are welcome to join. So for the high school that I'm in, which is called Ahead High School on a Friday afternoon, we have an esports club and it's really, really popular. Uh, there's lots of young people who are staying behind and participating in that. For COP26, one of the things that they could do, it was a competition where the number of trees that were uh, cut down during the game, they were going to be planted in real life. And the winner of all the competitions actually won this Xbox, a brand new Xbox, and it was won by a young person at St Aidan's High School. Um, the Brave Junior also run custom activities. So that's on a Wednesday night and any young person is welcome to join if they have the, the link to join. Um, and there's a £10 gift card that they can win. I think it's an Amazon gift card that they can win and it's whoever wins that competition. It's always Fortnite and our young people if they're part of that discord group as part of the future fridays group have that link to participate if they want there's also your national esports scotland um, where young people can participate in like against other local authorities um, part of our our partnership with the brave junior they've developed an sqa it's called eSports for the Players and it's SCQF level six. And there are seven different elements of this. Um, and although it's targeted at high school, we implement some of these uh, principles and units in some of the younger eSports clubs that we have. So we have a P67 STEM eSports group, and that's some of the pictures that you'll see there. So the first unit is um, understanding eSports. And this section talks about the history of esports in Scotland. It talks about career opportunities that are available, whether it's software development, game development, um, all the different opportunities, the, the different communities that are available as well for um, joining. So there's Discord and how to stay safe online, all these kind of things. The Being Online unit talks about health and well-being, talks about privacy and security and digital citizenship as well. Um, so this is one of the ones that we were focusing on for our P67 group last night. We were playing Fortnite, but we were also talking about managing screen time. So one of the things that we did, we made sure that the young people managed their game. So after their game, you, you know, try and find another activity to take, to take a break from it. Be aware of how much screen time that you have. Um, section three or unit three, the game sense. Is it esports or is it not esports? Not every computer game will be considered an esport. There has to be a competitive element to it. So, as much as uh, you might want to play Super Mario and become a professional Super Mario player, if unless you're doing like Super Mario Kart, where there is that kind of racing element to it, and you're responding to the other uh, participants in that game, then it's probably not going to be considered an esport. Um, the grind. This is everybody's favourite uh, unit because this is the one where you actually get to play all the games and participate. Um, the games that we are focusing on are Fortnite and Rocket League. And there's also another one, Super Smash Brothers, which is on the Nintendo Switch that we have. Um, we take that from group to group. And the really good thing about Super Smash Brothers is that it has a built-in tournament feature. So it can handle it can manage uh, 16 participants as part of a tournament that you're setting up all you do is set it up at the start you're introducing the controller like the, the functionality of the controller you put in the participants names and the game does the rest it organizes the tournament for you and it tells you who's playing who and it's all very fair and all very equal um, so the grind is it's talking about optimizing performance and game analysis and it's encouraging critical thinking because you don't just play the game what we'll do is we'll take time out after it and say how did you think that went you know what what could you have done better did you work well as a team how were your communication skills as a team if you were playing Fortnite as part of a trio um, critical thinking as well is one of the essential ones that we're trying to one of the essential skills that we're trying to develop just to get our young people thinking about you know what could you have done better what did you do well um, we've got the the teamwork makes the dream work unit um, what are your team's strengths 
and weaknesses. Uh, again, this is all back to the critical thinking element of esports and um, the problem solving part of it about identifying what they're good at and about celebrating that success you know like you were able to work out the angle for for that show or you were able to you know you were able to calculate that yeah you, you reacted really quickly you're building you're editing you know it, it's on point well done um, but maybe we need to look at communication you know maybe we need to talk um, and share more information as a team uh, point six is the competition. Esports is very focused on the competitive element. And if you have a number, if you have 16 young people as part of a Smash Brothers tournament, there can only be one winner. And you're going to have 15 young people who are very upset and um, perhaps uh, feeling unfairly uh, penalised if they haven't won that, that competition and they thought that they should have done. And on Friday there, we had a young person who had I got very upset that she had not succeeded in the game and she had to leave the room for a wee minute. So we were able to have a discussion on expectation management and just realistically how we cope with disappointment, how we um, build a sense of resilience and push through, you know, whatever it is. Do you enjoy the game? Yes, right. Let's look at how we can make this fun again then. Um, unit seven is the esports content. If you can only take three young people to a tournament and you have a group of maybe 16 young people as part of your esports group, then what do the rest do? It's not that it's just that they're just there to spectate and cheer people on. There's actually, if you have an esports club, there are lots of different roles that can be part of that esports club. So it's um, managing social media platforms, maybe compiling best bits, compilation videos, you know, um, we talk about video capturing and editing and how to manage all that and share it online and do so safely. You know, talking about, uh, you know, um, oh, the, the words just escape me, whether they've got permission for their, their photos to be online, whether they are happy sharing their username online. Lots of young people manage Twitch or Discord as part of their local esports clubs. So there are lots of different roles um, within an esports club. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has anything that they're wanting to ask and I'm not an expert in it. If you want to ask me anything about Fortnite then I'll try and answer. I, I've got a better chance of answering any questions there but does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? If not then I'll just stop sharing my screen then. Hi there. Um, Hi. I have a question. Um, with the SQA level six, can mm -hmm. adults take part in enrolling in this or is it just specifically for kids? Because I know that there would be a lot of like adults that I know would work with that um, would definitely be up for something like this. Yeah, I'm sure like this is all just in the pilot phase just now. And we're going to be working with the Brave Junior to pilot this SQA as part of some of our esports clubs. Um, but I'm sure that once the pilot has completed, that it could be opened up elsewhere. You know, it, it's an SQA, it's available for, um, it's not just age limited. Uh, anybody can participate in it. I think that's brilliant, yeah. It sounds a, a great initiative, I think, for a lot of kids. Plus, also good to see a fellow gamer as well, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> the way that the SQA came about, um, the Brave Junior had contacted us and asked us if we would be interested in partnering with them for esports clubs. And at the time, um, there was no kind of accreditation to it um, and we didn't really understand it. So Emma from the Brave Junior had gone away to try and find some accreditation that worked in well. And she had approached Edinburgh Napier and just said, you know, you've got a critical thinking SQA that I'm interested in developing for uh, esports and they had got back to her and said well we're actually interested in developing an esports qualification like we'd like to partner with you so this is um it's all been developed by the brave junior in edinburgh napier with a little bit of input from us as well 
Uh, but I'm really, really excited about the opportunities that this is going to present because there are so many young people. You know, we, we speak about meeting young people where they are. Lots of our young people have engaged in gaming over lockdown. And the beauty about this SQA that has been developed is that it can happen 100% online. Young people who maybe struggle to be in social situations are more than capable of participating in this because if they've got the kit at home, and they're already gaming, then we're meeting them where they are and we're engaging them uh, with an accreditation that they might not otherwise have uh, access to. And this, this award was actually designed for young people who are struggling at school and maybe not attending school and being at home. And it's a way of engaging them as well. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much for putting And I think it just shows a very unique example of using gaming digital skills online hybrid working, um, working with young people that can be in the most disengaged from education as well and provide the accreditation. It's, it's brilliant. So mm -hmm. thanks very much for that input. I really appreciate it. Um, Helly, you pass back to yourself and, and introduce our next presenter. Thanks, Ali. Yes, really, really interesting to hear um, about the, the kind of connections there between um, education and and reaching out to young people who are not in the you know maybe not in school or whatever I think that's that's fabulous so um next up we've got Lauren and Alison um joining us from Dumfries and Galloway um and um, um I'm delighted to um be able to introduce them as um nominees for the National Youth Work Awards um in the um digital and STEM category um so that's that's exciting um so with with that and simply that I'll hand over to you guys and you can do the rest of the introductions Thank you. Thanks, Hilary. We weren't going to mention that we were finalists. <laughs> um, so hi, yeah, I'm Alison Hill um, from Dumfries and Galloway Council's Youth Work Service, um, and this is Lauren Asher. Um, so we're just going to tell you a bit about um, the kind of digital work that we've been doing um, over the last couple of years. Um, we're just going to start with a bit of setting the scene. Um, so prior to the, the COVID pandemic starting in March 2020, we were doing pretty much no digital youth work. Um, we had some social media platforms that we produced a little bit of content for, but that was about the extent of it. Um, on the 16th of March 2020, um, our full-time staff team were called into a meeting and told that as of five o'clock that day, all our face-to-face -face services would be closing. As a person, that was a terrifying thought, but as a professional, it was even worse because what did that mean for all of our young people? Um, not just the ones that we work with, but across the whole of the region. Um, what was that going to be like? We had, we had no experience of delivering digital youth work. We didn't know what the best platforms would be, how to run a digital youth group, but also what were the risks of us not doing anything digitally? So within 24 hours, we transformed our whole service to a digital one um, from face to face. This involved using a variety of different online platforms, most of which we had no prior knowledge of. So it was a lot of trial and error um, for stuff. We were trying to use the platforms that were more, most accessible for young people, which didn't always mean it was the most accessible for us as staff, particularly working for a local authority. We were trying to utilise social media to engage young people throughout the day, including offering live streams. One of the very first sessions we delivered um, was, a, was a live music night, which in hindsight was a terrible idea. Um, social media obviously um, blocked a lot of the music that was being played for copyright purposes and stuff, but the engagement we got from young people through chat functions and a closed Zoom session that night was incredible. And that was what gave us the motivation to go on because we knew from that first session the impact that we were having and that young people knew we were still there and we hadn't just abandoned them. We had a focus on keeping young people connected with us and with each other. We were identifying early on young people who were digitally excluded and we went ahead and sourced local and national funding to support them getting online at a point where Connecting Scotland and schools were not yet providing devices or dongles. 
while the majority of our youth work staff team was redeployed to other services in need within the council, we had a core team that stayed within youth, youth work. We worked hard to put a robust training programme in place um, for those who remained with the youth work service to ensure that the staff were they were delivering online were confident with what they were delivering and how to use the online platforms. Our, our creation then con continued with a fully online digital youth work service that included online groups, whether those be drop-in sessions or focused targeted groups, as well as um, via social media using digital programs that young people could get involved in and do at home or like on calls with their friends and stuff like that. We created isolation packs as we called them, which included a variety of different kind of resources and tools that young people could use at home for activities, but also included a form of um, accreditation that young people could take part in and send back to us so that they were gaining informal qualifications as they would normally through our face-to-face -face services. We also continue to provide our kind of low level mental health one to one support, whether that be on phone calls or through Zoom or through Teams. And during this whole process, because we were having to adapt so quickly, we were working with young people to change policies within the council to make different things accessible for young people and to make sure that they were safe and inclusive of young people's kind of rights and cyber resilience. So um, where are we at now? Um, so we now have a, a digital youth work team, which I am part of. Um, I work alongside four colleagues, uh, one of whom is a modern apprentice. Um, and we work to complement the face-to-face -face provision um, and other projects that run within the youth work service, um, with our focus particularly being um, working with young people to develop their cyber resilience and digital literacy skills. Um, so throughout the pandemic, one of the things we worked with young people on was to develop a bespoke youth information website. Um, so we worked with young people to create a website that enables them to um, access confidential one-to-ones, um, but also to share their stories, share their, their experiences of different issues. Um, and sort of share techniques and tools that have helped them, um, as well as signposting them to local services and groups that might be able to offer support. Um, we also now have a content creators group um, of young people who we have been working with to train them up in social media safety, um, how to edit, how to create videos, podcasting, um, lots of different um, opportunities for them to share their stories and share their their life story, their, their world view through technology. Um, and we've also worked closely with local partners. Um, so in the run up to Bonfire Night, um, our content creators worked alongside the fire service to film um, interactive TikToks that explore, explored bonfire safety with young people. Um, and as a result, the level of antisocial behaviour that the fire service encountered on bonfire night was significantly reduced. Um, and when doing workshops with young people in schools, the fire service came back to us and said, oh, the young people um, quite often said, oh, we know that piece of information because we learned it from your TikTok. And I think that just shows that um, although it might not be massive, um, it might not seem massive putting a video out about bonfire safety, the impact that it then had on young people was massive. Um, so we are still delivering um, digital youth work um, with running weekly online groups. Um, we are reaching young people online who aren't able to come to face-to-face -to -face services for whatever reason. Um, particularly, we've got a thriving ASN youth group um, who don't access face-to-face, -face, um, but have created a brilliant online community um, where they explore different issues. Um, currently, they are doing virtual visits. So last week, we had a space-themed session um, where we did a virtual planetarium and visited NASA. Um, so there's loads of opportunities um, for those young people who, in a face-to-face -face group, they might not have considered uh, doing any of those sorts of projects. Um, 
We're also doing hybrid groups. We, are, we do have young people accessing online, but young people also accessing in buildings. Um, and that allows us to work with young people right across Dumfries and Galloway, regardless of uh, the rural barriers that, that quite a lot of them face. Um, and we're also um, working on sort of digital activism projects, um, working with young people on um, identifying, sort of looking at gender stereotypes um, and identity through social media, um, as well as using Dungeons and Dragons um, to explore kind of storytelling and um, healthy relationships. So what's next for us? Um, we are hoping to continue to break down barriers for young people and use digital as a way of connecting young people. Um, we are supporting young people to, to um, redevelop our social media for their own so that it's their platforms um, and supporting them to create the content for those. Um, we're hoping to be able to find new ways of supporting young people with digital literacy. Um, so that includes the funding that we received from YouthLink Scotland, um, where young people are designing uh, cyber resilience badges um, to support other young people to learn about uh, cyber resilience and digital safety. And that's us. I feel like that was a really whistle talk to our. <laughs> Um, thanks so much both. Um, really brilliant to hear both what happened, you know, your response to that, your rapid response to that, um, and how that's developed over the piece, um, but actually how that's now it's such an integral part of what um, you're doing, um, kind of day by day, um, and, and the impact that you've seen that having. Um, does anybody have questions that they'd like to, to put to um, Lauren and Alison just now? Um, obviously, you can you can type questions in the chat um, if you want to do that, um, and we can maybe come back to a little bit of open discussion at the end. But if if you do have a question, do feel free to switch on. I can't see, well, I can't quite see everybody, so I might miss a hand. Um, so feel free to switch on and say if you want to. Or Jamie, I will hand back to you then. That was brilliant, Lauren and Alison. Thank you much for that. Really appreciate that input and can really see the passion and energy you've got for it as well. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I would like to pass to our final presenters now, who are um, uh, Nicola and Kate for Aberdeen Council, um, part of the Working with Young People team there and Community Learning Development. Um, and they'll just tell you more about the work that they do um, and all the kind of stuff uh, how that links to the digital work as well. Pass to yourself, Nicola. Thanks, Jamie. Um, hi there, I'm Nicola, uh, part of a duo. <laughs> um, Kate will follow uh, shortly too. We're going to share our presentation uh, with you and we've got a tendency to talk an awful lot. Um, so we'll try and, and keep it as brief as we can. I have to say, so listening to the other presentations, the introduction this morning um, and the, the start of this session, We've, we've all shared the same experiences, haven't we? And we've, we've come up on the same kind of barriers and, and how to overcome those. Um, so it's been interesting to hear other people's views, view, viewpoints on that um, as well. So our first slide, um, we're going to look at um, mainly our mental health and wellbeing peer, pro uh, peer educators project, um, which I think starts in the next slide coming up. And um, we just, this, this was really, um, a new project that we uh, developed over lockdown um, and so we were starting from scratch um, and you know Aberdeen shares a wide a, a large rural area it's huge um, and our central point for getting young people together can be a, for, for some young people to our journey there and to our journey back um, so getting our young people together has, has always been a challenge for us across the whole of Aberdeen shares so we tend to do a lot of our youth work in within the 17 catchment, academy catchment areas um, and pull young people together through youth voice projects. So I think because of lockdown, we, this, this no thanks about it actually, because of lockdown, this, this project um, was our very first Aberdeenshire wide digital project that we, we delivered from start to finish. 
um, and um, it took us quite a bit of time to think through the process and how that might look and, and how we would deliver that fully on online. Uh, Kate and I were uh, fairly challenged with that thought, weren't we, Kate? Um, and along the way, we found even doubt, you know, we, we, we planned the project, we secured the funding through the Youth Work Education Recovery Fund, um, and we promoted with our existing CLD learners and school pupils. We relied very heavily on the schools to help us to promote that project um, because we weren't like everybody else uh, fully engaging uh, the way we would normally do through our youth work programmes. Um, we identified the, the mental health and wellbeing training provider who was Sam H who worked really well with us to, to deliver a programme that, that used a number of different methods um, to engage young people and keep them, keep them interested. Um, and then really the last the last few points I've got there on the run up to the project all kind of happened together. We were recruiting for staff whilst we were trying to engage young people at the time um, to sign up for the project um, as, as, as well as jointly planning the delivery with uh, Sam H or Sam H colleagues. So that's our kind of run into the project, Kate. Your so, um, yeah, as uh, Nicola stated just now, it was Youth Work Education Recovery Funding that uh, funded this project. So um, the, the project outcomes that we identified um, were about young people managing personal, social and formal relationships, young people participating safely and effectively, young people considering risk, making reasoned decisions and taking control, young people expressing their voice and demonstrating social commitment and young people broadening their perspectives through new experiences and thinking. Um, this is all with um, a focus on mental health and well-being and we were looking at how we can support young people themselves to support their peers, um, especially throughout COVID and post-COVID or whenever that's going to be, um, about supporting um, their mental health and well-being in a situation where we weren't able to have as many youth work staff working face-to-face -face with, with these young people. So um, that was the, the, where, the place where this project came from. Nicola? Yeah. Um... <laughs> So when it came to the project development um, side of it, um, there was a lot of hair pulling, Kate, wasn't there, in <laughs> in how we were going to actually uh, make it look. Because naturally, um, if if we were ever to even have considered digital um, means, I think we would have planned in a session at the beginning so that young people got that opportunity to meet face to face and build those relationships. Because we all know that there are added challenges when working with a new group of young people online that you know picking up that that drink when you walk in or chat in between workshops those kind of things uh, don't naturally flow in an online environment so um, so we tried our hardest to program in time that 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 there was a wee bit of small group work where, where young people could get a chance to do that networking and building relationships um, with staff as well as with one another um, so we decided that we would go for um, we would split the training into two and the CLD team took a lead on the peer educator training um, and it covered these, these elements. We ran it over um, three sessions, two hours um, each and uh, they were in the evening. So um, after school time, after online school time, home, home schooling time um, and it was just a chance to find in the time of day as always, is quite difficult with everybody in um, the right time and, uh, and the right day. But we managed to, to find um, time that almost, if not all of those that were interested in being part of, they could connect into. So this was our, our CLD element. And then there were the Sam H sessions, Kate. So we ended up, um, we partnered up with Sam H. Um, we discussed how we were going to deliver the mental health and wellbeing part of the training. And I think um, even though our CRD staff had experience and would have been able to deliver this, we thought it would be better, best practice to, to 
bring a partner in, um, into the training at this point, it gave us a much broader, much richer content, but it also gave another voice and another perspective, which when you're engaging online, um, I think, you know, it's really important to try and bring in that variety. So um, Sam H were our partners, they delivered three sessions um, and they focused on the mental health and well-being part of the training. So they were looking at defining what mental health and well-being actually is. We looked at stigma, we looked at health problems, listening skills, supporting each other. We also looked quite a lot at self-care for the young people who were uh, taking part. Um, and then we also gave them lots of tools and resources and, and where to get support. So again, there was a lot of head itching at this point, wasn't there, um, in their delivery methods um, and which would be the best platform to use. Uh, Kate did uh, most of the groundwork around that and came upon Google Classroom, which we'd been using um, Google Meet with young people um, in, other, in, in other opportunities we were, we were running. Um, but Google Classroom was a, was a good find, we thought, for, for this, this type of project. Um, it meant that we had somewhere that everything could be kept uh, for young people and for staff to be able to go in and see what had happened during a session or, or to catch up if folk hadn't been able to attend or internet issues had, had come upon our way. So um, Google Classroom was really good in that way. That, you know, there was a lot of reassurance we did with young people at the beginning that, you know, we, we live in rural Aberdeenshire, we, we understand that we're going to lose connectivity, that, um, that your Wi-Fi could just give up. You're not going to be able to join a meeting, perhaps. You know what? Let's not stress about it. We've got a space. Everything that, that, that we've done is there. Dip in and, and find what you're looking for. So I think that worked really, really well. Um, and we also, um, as part of that, you know, don't worry about your Wi-Fi uh, connection. We did a lot of some, some of the catch-up sessions with individuals who perhaps dipped dipped out halfway through because of connectivity or they, they would um, send us an email or give us a call we would catch up with them just to make sure that young people felt that they were um, fully participating and that, 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 that our rural wi-fi issues didn't impact on those um, we also uh, as everybody else did look to find how we spiced up our online delivery um, so that we kept a good mixture of, um, of, of activities, a good mixture of different people talking, um, ensuring that there's plenty of space for young people to do that. We used a range of, um, of software and digital tools to help us do that as well. Um, the chat bar, I think, was, was great um, because you got the instant response from young people as and when you needed it. it we will talk a wee bit later on about some of the hesitancies around young people connecting, um, you know, talking and putting the camera on and things like that. The chat, chat bar was, was great for that kind of thing, um, just to, re to reduce any anxieties around that. Um, so yeah, Go to the next slide. So the, uh, the impact of the project, um, we had an excellent response from the young people that took part. Uh, we weren't sure at the beginning what sort of a take up we were going to have and what sort of you know retainment we were going to have and, and and if the young people would enjoy it or not. Um, but they they all took part and enjoyed it. Um, so we've now delivered two training programs um, and we have now trained fifty four peer educators who are who are now um, working throughout Aberdeenshire. Um, the feedback from young people at all the training sessions was extremely positive. Um, any negative feedback was about things like connectivity and the fact that we were doing this online and they would rather do it face to face. But uh, we obviously we knew that that was going to be um, um, a problem. Um, so 100% of the peer educators who took part, they reported an increase in confidence around their own but also supporting other people in their mental health and well-being. So although we now have peer educators who are supporting others, they reported an increase in their own mental health and well-being by taking part in the programme. Um, feedback from our partners has been extremely positive. And Sam H, as a result of being involved in this, they've now um, employed um, a worker 
who's now working in Aberdeenshire face to face with young people, um, a time for me worker. Um, and that's a direct result of the work that they've done with us throughout this project. So, so that's been really, really positive. So we have 17 learning networks um, in Aberdeenshire and we have uh, peer educators now in 15 of those 17 networks. Um, they're now delivering things like workshops, uh, lunchtime drop-ins, chill out spaces. Um, they are delivering to um, um, assemblies and PSE classes with the younger um, age groups in their schools. Um, and so far, up to date, it's it's still happening. So this number is increasing all the time. But so far, 492 young people have taken part in local workshops that have been delivered by peer educators. So we've just kind of summed up um, our barriers and challenges and the benefits and unintended outcomes that came upon using digital delivery. Um, of a new project. Um, some of those we've already covered and, and share with other people that, that have spoken um, already today. And I think Lauren and Alison, um, I think you mentioned the, the, the consents, the issue around uh, digital consent, folk consent, all those kind of things that, that, again, you normally do, you know, sitting around a table with young people and, it, and, and it's relatively easy um, I'm, I'm listening to what I'm saying. Sometimes it can be challenging, even face to face, actually. But um, online, we, we we found that even harder to ensure that uh, young people felt safe, um, and and that we had everything we required to make sure that we were uh, within our own policies. Um, so that that created quite a bit of a uh, flurry, and and I, and I think we came up with two or three different versions of how to do that as time went on. Um, just to ensure that, as I say, that we've got we've got everything in place. We had to change some of the formats of of uh, some of the forms that we have, and try to make it just a wee bit easier um, with, with young people. So that for us, I think, took up quite a bit of time. The promotion of the project again, because we weren't meeting with young people face to face the way that we normally would, we relied on a lot of our partners for that promotion. Um, as well as the relationship that we have uh, with our youth forums and things like that within our 17 areas. So, um, so again, that looked very different. Um, we've already spoken a wee bit there about relationship building with learners online. Um, and, and you know, we try to break out into breakout rooms and try and mix people up so that we've got a chance to meet different staff and different young people, but also trying to build up particular relationships with some young people in neighbouring communities. Um, Young people's varied response in talking and using the camera. We, we, we found we were quite surprised. Uh, we expected it, absolutely. Um, but as time went on, we were finding it quite surprising how difficult um, young people, some young people were finding that. So we had, we had to kind of rethink and change the way that we were working all the time to try and encourage that confidence building um, with the young people. And the thought that they were about to go out and deliver their own projects, you know, um, this is your safe space so we did a lot of and tried quite a few different strategies to get there and I think I think we did get there in the end but everybody was happily turning on their camera and uh, not using the chat bar so much um, and, and unmuting and hearing their voices so that was great. Accreditation, we'd, we'd built in accreditation around the programme um, and Again, face to face, you just pop everything on the table, don't you? And it's quite a nice interactive um, moving around activity that you do with young people um, for them to pull together their portfolios. Online, again, very difficult to with a, with a group as big as the group that we had. Um, to be able to do that was, was quite challenging. So perhaps I think um, it's fair to say that we didn't quite meet what we'd hoped from our accreditation. But that's good. That's a, you know, we've identified that and we'll look at how we build that in going forward. Um, and obviously that the, the last minute assessments and exams for young people um, come out of lockdown and, and as restrictions were even easing, that caused a lot of uh, pressure for them. So we saw a wee bit of a um, dip out at that point, which absolutely um, was the right thing for them to do. So again, we almost changed our time scales around that so that we could meet um, the needs of the young people. And that's hence where the second course came in so quickly after the first was so that we could um, remove remove any added pressure for them. Um, the benefits and unintended outcomes, 
the rural access thing for us, like I said earlier, you know, the fact that young people are having to travel for four hours just to attend a couple hour meeting, it's a full day. Um, for some, the digital online learning has, has been fantastic in, in that way. And we're finding that young people are connecting in much quicker and much easier um, with, with less time commitment required from them. Um, so it makes it more doable and realistic. Um, focus meetings, everybody knows what they're coming into. They're, they're set up and they're ready to go. Kate always, you know, before a meeting would send out information about what was going to be happening, recapping the meeting before, so that folk knew as soon as they, they, they clicked in what they were coming into and trying to maintain that consistent um, kind of introduction um, stage, I think was really important as well. Um, staff team support was invaluable. Without, without the level of a team buy-in, we wouldn't have been able to achieve what we did. You know, when you work face to face, you've got the physical um, elements that you need extra staff for. And when you're working digitally, I think it's even more so just to ensure that you can create those little spaces um, and that in the 17 networks, they can continue to meet with their um, with their local worker as well. That, that again, just helps to encourage um, and, and promote um, their their creation of their own wee projects, their own workshops. And obviously for us in Aberdeenshire, you know, get, getting facilitators coming from the central belt, belt can be quite expensive to us. Um, and it, it can be quite difficult because you're not just asking somebody to come up to run a two, two hour course. It takes a day and a half really by the time they've added in travel um, and travel back home again. So that was much more economical. So therefore um, more accessible for us. And there's a quote there at the bottom from um, some of the evaluations that we did with peer educators. So future steps. Um, yeah, we're going to continue to support those peer educators we've already trained and we are now able to support them face to face locally as well. Um, but we still continue to meet with them um, online. So um, they've made they've made friends and relationships with young people from across the Shire. So um, I said, we've got a, a, a geographically very large local authority. So it's really difficult bringing those young people together. Um, even before COVID, it was difficult bringing them all together. So we've now established an online place where they can come and meet each other and share their experiences um, across the different areas in, in the Shire. Um, so we will continue to do that. We're planning to bring them together uh, when we're allowed to. I, th I think that time is getting closer um, to have a bit of a face-to-face -face celebration. They've all worked really hard um, and we really want to bring them together for a face-to-face -face celebration. So hopefully that will come up, hopefully in the summer. Um, the peer educators that we've already trained up, they're keen to be involved in the next lot of peer education training that we deliver. So um, I think the idea is that they will be able to roll out the training to young people in their own schools uh, to keep the project going. So they will be involved with that. As well as that, though, we will continue to facilitate um, an online project. It has worked well and we want to include, um, you know, a more hybrid approach, but we don't want to lose all of the good things that we've um, discovered um, by by going online with, with this project. Um, I think it, it's sort of easy to um, think about going back to face to face, but I think we have to think about going forward um, and incorporating all those good things that, that we've learned. Um, little things like before before COVID, we were talking about the, you know, permissions and consents and things like that. And before COVID, all of that was done physically, you know, on paper. And it's like, I'm not sure why we were still doing that because it's so much easier to actually get young people to link into a Microsoft forum or something like that. And, it, and it's that bit has worked so much better uh, for us, you know, um, over COVID. Um, and then again, we're gonna continue with the accreditation program. We didn't quite get that right last time, but as a result of this project, we've now <laughs> done a lot of learning and we are going to design something that is much better incorporated into the delivery of the programme so that all young people taking part have an opportunity to achieve some kind um, of accreditation. Um, and I don't think we'll go into this slide. Um, I think we just wanted to show a wee bit of contrast between starting a project from scratch 
um, around digital delivery and modifying an existing project and, and the, um, the difficulties and the benefits that we, we, we got from that. I think we'll just leave that one though, because I'm, I'm aware that our timing um, <laughs> has, has exceeded our 10 minutes. So, um, and I think we've heard from others that gives that nice contrast as well. So, so thank you. Is there any questions or? I think if we just go to Jamie just now, that would be great. And yeah. um, but if people do have questions, then then um, yeah, pop them in the chat at the moment, and we'll hold them um, for a minute or two. But that was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, very much. Thank you. That was great. a unique way of doing peer education and working with young people, but doing it in a way um, that a lot of people wouldn't think of normally, um, especially it's such a face-to-face -face thing, but to do it digitally and to do it digitally so well is really inspiring. Um, one of the things we're just going to do now is just a, a quick wee synopsis of what we've sort of gathered information just to get some views. So um, what I'm going to do is just put a little um, quick Mentimeter on the screen. Um, it's only got three questions, so we're not going to hold people People back too long um, and hopefully address any questions at the end. But ultimately, it's just to get people's views when it comes to digital youth work and what makes it great and what kind of things still need to be uh, worked on a little bit. So I'm just going to share my screen um, and hopefully this works. Uh, uh, gathering views in such a way that um, helps us kind of. Kind of just for ourselves, education school and I'm sure Hillary at YouthLink, what is still needed out there. Um, so everybody can hopefully see that. Um, just a uh, me touch you up. Um, just to scan the phone or just to put in the specific uh, website. Um, for another couple of seconds. And like I say, there's um, a couple of questions that we want to ask in regards to um, uh, process, I suppose, around it as well. Um, I'll just, I'm conscious of time, but I'll, I'll put the code in the chat as well, um, just in case um, anyone has managed to do the code. So first question for people to participate comes up fine. So it's just a simple wee thing. What do you think are the key elements of digital youth work? Um, so everybody here has um, maybe got some experience in the youth work or their practice over the last couple of years. Um, some of the things that make that good from your experience or again, doesn't have to be your own practice, things that you've seen across the world um, and what makes it inspiring that way. So if you've never done a Mentimeter before, I'm always conscious, it just depends. Um, the, the biggest words are also the ones that are said the most. So fun is obviously key there, interactive, accessible. Um, I think accessible is a really key one. We've kind of highlighted through, it's been mentioned through the conference today, making sure people have the chance to do it, um, depending on their location, their equipment, their ability level. Um, <clears throat> some really good elements there, relationships, engaging. Key. I think that's some of the examples we've provided today um, shows that the engaging methods work the best um, because young people will always decide with you know, their actions, they'll either take part or they won't. Um, keep it interesting, good. I think that's pretty much key amount of responses. So I'm just going to move on to the next three question. What barriers exist to embedding digital youth work? So we've talked about barriers today in regards to some of the challenges that face us um, as services, as councils, as third sector organisations. Uh, and it's interesting to know what are the kind of main um, difficulties that exist. So back in the start of pandemic, um, platforms that were used, um, the sort of like tools, online tools that were being used as well. Um, but what barriers still um, online fatigue. I'm pretty sure we've all experienced a bit of that. Uh, unskilled workforce. Yep, I think that's something that's can be a, a bit of a key element there, depending on the makeup of your staff teams, your colleagues, or volunteers. Connectivity, accessibility, 
Zoom Doom. I've not heard that one before. <laughs> it's quite good. Um, uh, consent issues, red tape. Um, I think for those that us that work across local authorities, that's definitely one that's a, a difficulty depending on the, the challenges that you face in regards to um, what programs and the content you can actually utilize. Um, that's excellent. I'll just move on to the final wee question here. Hopefully, I'll just give another wee second actually. Um, you can probably see the participants, the question answers down in the bottom right there, 20 people of, or 20 answers as such. So um, you can submit multiple answers. Skills for youth workers, digital poverty. Yep. Excellent. And the last little one here, um, just as some points of view, what skills and knowledge do you need to, to improve your digital youth work? So speaking on behalf of maybe the people you also work with, your colleagues, your teams, what skills and knowledge are still needed? So I think in the majority of cases, using platforms like Zoom or Microsoft Teams is probably a lot better than it was at the start of the pandemic. Um, but what skills and needs, knowledge is still, what specifics, I suppose, is still needed? Um, skills and confidence in games, yep, I think that's quite key. Um, exposure to online games. Uh, I think as Susan was saying in her um, input, it's, there's so many and they're so varied and there's so many that are used by different young people in different ways or different um, sorry, outcomes, I suppose, in regards to what they achieve and why they do it and the sort of nature of games themselves are very different to others. Um, resources, yeah, I think. Um, the field of youth work, and I know in the field of CLD, some resources available can be quite sporadic or in different locations at different times, um, and also know where to go for those resources. Skills and training, digital platforms, different platforms and their features, good. Being safe online, um, completing forms and booklets online. Yeah, again, so many different ones are used. Um, training and how they convert into skills in the digital world. Uh, these are all excellent answers. Um, sorry, leave these this slide up particularly for people to submit their ideas, because I think um, for both of us as two separate organizations, it's important for us to know what's still needed. Um, and so hopefully, you know, keep submitting views. Um, that will help us kind of understand where to go from here. Um, because there's many innovative pieces of work that are happening. And it's about utilizing the, the good practice that we share today, but also the good practice to skill, upskill the workforce that's out there and all the organisations, be the councils, subset, charity, uh, voluntary, any shape or form that um, we can support them the best that we can. Um, really good answer. Thank you for that. Um, I'll just stop sharing my screen. People can stop answers in, but um, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, Jamie, I think we'll be able to share that back with people, won't we, afterwards? So we'll we'll hopefully put together slides um, from today um, and that mentee, um, and that will be available. And we'll we'll make we'll make it available um, to all the delegates um, at the at the conference. And we'll be putting all the all the stuff mm -hmm. together um, in one one place for people. So um, it's one of the challenges of a day like this is that it creates an enormous amount of of knowledge and information and then we have to kind of connect in with that and um, find out how best we can use it. Um, but I think it, it certainly, as, as Jamie says, really, really useful for us to sort of just hear people's immediate responses to that question of, you know, what is it that you need from a, a skills and training point of view? What are the barriers? What are the things that you're working with? Um, and as I say, that's one of, one of the the, the big reasons for running this particular session is just um, to help um, to help everybody to to see some of the good practice that's out there and I'm you know I certainly found all of those presentations enormously inspiring um, and exciting and um, um, you know do do keep in touch with each other and um, connect over some of the work that's happening there and um, the one other thing that I would maybe just mention in this context at the moment is that with a, a small um, STEM professional um, fund grant from Education Scotland um, we are currently running a digital makerspaces learning community um, and that may well become a little bit of a model for um, looking at other specific needs around um, 
um, digital youth work um, and certainly the folk involved in that is a, is a sort of group of around a dozen people who are meeting um, fairly regularly um, over the course of this year just to just explore their practice so that's the it's the kind of thing you know that we're really interested in understanding is what it is um, people need um, to support them.